Name, date of birth, and place of birth, please. Uh, it's Robert L. Winkowski. Uh, I was born in uh, January uh, 7th of 1925 uh, in Auburn, New York. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Uh, I went through uh, my junior year and into uh, my senior year, and uh, I left to enlist in the service uh, before I graduated. Okay. Do you remember where you were uh, when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yeah, I do. Um, I happened to be uh, over at one of the, it was a small game room where they had pinball machines. Mm -hmm. And I was playing pinball machines that day. Mm -hmm. And they had the radio on and we heard about it. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction? Did you? I was stunned. I couldn't understand it. Mm -hmm. you know? Of course, I was only, um, at the time I was 16 years old. So I knew nothing about wars mm -hmm. uh, and not that much really about uh, World War I other than that it was a ferocious war mm -hmm. and a lot of wounded, a lot of people gassed and you know, that sort of thing. But uh, it was just Did amazing. you even know where Pearl Harbor was? Had no idea. Yep, most people. No idea whatsoever. You know, Dowdsville, New York was a very little town. Uh, you didn't go too far away from it. Maybe to Utica, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Albany, if uh, it was a big deal. Uh, but basically, mm -hmm. that's the way life was. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> okay, did you enlist or were you drafted? I enlisted. Why? Why? Well, the main reason that I enlisted was because all of my buddies, they were older than I was. I hung out with an older crowd. And they had all left for the service. The fellows that I knew that were left were going, so I decided that I'd enlist mm -hmm. and go into the service. The Andrew sisters were singing the right songs, you know. Uh -huh. The bands were playing the right music, and you kind of just fell into the spirit of the thing, you know. Uh, there was hell to pay with my father and my mother, but I went to Utica. Uh, to enlist. Were they, they weren't aware that you were going to do this? They had no idea. I went to Utica to enlist and at the time uh, they wouldn't do much of anything for me because <clears throat> I was too young. They said that I needed my father's consent. So anyway, uh, I did manage to get them to do the physical. I said, well, if I pass the physical, I can probably get them to agree. Mm -hmm. So I passed the physical, took papers back, had them signed by my mother and father it was terrible. And uh, enlisted, uh, that was in uh, December. And then in uh, January, I went into the, uh, February, I went into the service. So of what year? Uh, 1943. Okay. Um, did you pick the Army Air Corps? I had a choice. Mm -hmm. So I picked the Army Air Corps. Now, yeah. why? Why did um, you pick that? It just sounded like a, a great place to be. Had you, know, you ever been in an airplane? Off we go into the wild blue yonder, you know, they were singing those songs. Had you ever been in an airplane? Oh yeah, I had been in planes mm -hmm. before. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Piper Cubs, you know, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. But nothing big. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, I enjoyed the Air Force, but I, I got to say that uh, it was nerve-wracking, a lot of it. Uh, Initially, it was a real experience for me. Uh, I had been in the woods as a Boy Scout, you know, for years, so I was used to roughing it. Um, so none of that bothered me. Um, uh, going to Camp Upton, uh, that was a little bit exciting. Is that where you went for your basic training? Uh, no, that was just uh, a kind or of... your induction. That's center. the induction. Mm -hmm. We got our shots there and so on. Mm -hmm. We were only there three, four days or a week. Mm -hmm. Why was that such an experience for you? Oh my God, there were people there from all over, you know. I mean, I was meeting people from New Jersey, from the Carolinas, from every place. Uh, and it was such a busy thing, you know, when you live in a small town like Dallasville, uh, you don't anticipate large crowds. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was something for me. Mm -hmm. Where did you go for your basic training? Miami Beach, Florida. And uh, 
We arrived at Miami Beach wearing ODs. It was very, very cold at Camp Upton. So when we got to Miami, it was very, very hot. And uh, we didn't have time to change clothes. We went down and uh, a lot of cars had wooden seats in them. So there were no comforts at all all the way down. It was mm -hmm. a terrible ride. But when we got to Miami, it was quite hot. It was in, in the 80s, as I recall, or 90s. So we were very quick to change clothes. Now, what was your basic like in, in Miami? Uh, the only duty that I had at the time, other than the parading up and down, the marching, mm -hmm. up hip, hip, floor, you know, um, we were out on the beach as guards at night, uh, submarines coming in mm -hmm. and this sort of thing. Uh, as far as the uh, parade drills went, uh, I got a break because I played the trumpet when I was in high school. They needed a bugler. So they asked if anyone here could blow a bugle. I said, sure, I can blow a bugle. I used to blow it up at the scout camp up mm -hmm. on White, White Lake. Uh, so that got me off of all of the details. And that's all I had to do. It was a very easy basic training. Now how long did that last? Uh, I think we were down there about uh, six weeks. Uh -huh. Five, six weeks. It wasn't long. The accommodations were great. Uh, I was up at, uh, I recall the, the address, it was 90th and Collins, all the way up on the beach. And uh, we were using motels at the time, little hotels and so mm -hmm. on. So that was different. Um, we had, we had te been tested uh, while we were there for whatever occupation we were going to enjoy in the service. Mm -hmm. Uh, fortunately for me, my hobby was photography. As a kid, I loved it. And I had, you know, I had developed my own pictures and printed them and everything else when I was in high school. Uh, so it was almost a natural that they would send me to a photo reconnaissance outfit. Uh, I went out to Lowry Field, Colorado. And uh, I was there for 12 weeks. The training out there was very extensive. We had the finest equipment that you could possibly ask for as far as uh, cameras. Uh, we were using a speed graphic 4x5 for most of everything that we were doing. And uh, we had enlargers that were unbelievable. They could blow it up the side of that wall. and. Uh, I trained there for 12 weeks. That was a wonderful experience. Uh, we'd get a chance to go into town on weekends in the Denver. And the people in Denver were very hospitable. I'll tell you, if they saw a GI walking back to the base, they'd stop and pick them up, take them for a ride. Many times I was invited out to dinner, you know, mm -hmm. with families in Denver. Uh, it was quite an experience there. Uh, after uh, my uh, training at Lowry Field, uh, I was shipped to uh, Thomasville, Georgia. Complete reversal in the way people treated GIs. <coughs> and what seemed to become most apparent in Thomasville was that they, they hated Negroes. It was, a, it was terrible. They weren't allowed to walk on the uh, streets. Uh, they walked off the curb when white people came by. Uh, we had no blacks in the outfit at all. Uh, and that's where uh, I got into the 38th photo recon. Mm -hmm. Now did you find Southerners uh, not as open with you because you were a northerner or well uh, were the people in the town how did they act toward the soldiers that were especially northerners the people in the town um, weren't that sociable really mm -hmm. uh, i think they had a resentment you know that all of these guys from the north were down there in the south and of course we used to frequent the bars go out for a beer you know uh, on weekends and at night if we got out uh, but we did spend a lot of money there, 
you know, in the town itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I met a girl there. Uh, her name was Joy, uh, Joyce Feinberg. And uh, she took me home to dinner. Uh, uh, but I've got to tell you, her parents were not happy that I wasn't Jewish, you know, and that I wasn't from the South. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was funny. Uh, I went out with her quite a bit. I liked to dance. We had great times. Um, working out at the base was a lot of fun. It really was. Uh, we had a lot of uh, crashes, plane crashes, P-39s. They uh, had a nose cannon in them and they were very, very nose heavy. All our pilots that were coming there were trainees. They were 21, 20 years old, 22. Probably the oldest, 22. And, you know, they take these planes up after flying primary trainers. Uh, and, uh, well, they go into a flat spin, end up in the peanut fields in Georgia. We go out and take photographs of the crashes and that sort of thing. Now, you were assigned uh, to your unit, the 38th there? Yeah. Um, all right. When, um, how long were you in Georgia? Uh, I was in Georgia for about uh, three months, maybe three and a half months. And where did you go? I was shipped to Muskogee, Oklahoma to go overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in Muskogee uh, for 30 days max. That was it. And from there we shipped out to uh, wherever we were going. No one knew mm -hmm. at the time. We left from, uh, as I recall, Pittsburgh, California. And uh, now, how did you get from Oklahoma to California? The train. The train. Okay. It took us by train. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was nighttime when we got on the ship to go. Um, we were out for, gee, I think it was about 18 days on the water because. That, that ship stopped so many times for what they thought they heard submarines, you know. And it was very nerve-wracking, to say the least. Now, were you in a convoy? No, we weren't in a convoy. It was a lone ship, mm -hmm. all by its lonesome. There were about uh, 1,600 uh, people on it. Your whole unit was on it? Yeah. Now, how many in your unit, well, approximately? These, most of these guys that you see in this picture, they were much of my unit. Mm -hmm. Why don't you can hold that up now since these, you're talking about it. These were the, uh, this was the uh, photo. Uh, uh, hold, hold it back further. This okay. was a photo unit itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not all of them ended up in the same unit. Now are you in that picture? Yeah. I'm in here. Where, can you point to yourself and I can zoom in on it? Right here. I remember it well, okay. the big whack, because I had an ulcerated tooth. Mm. We no, can put that down there. Okay. Now, when you say that's the photo unit, what do you mean by that? That Those were the people that I worked with. Okay, overseas. they were the ones that did all the developing yeah. and, and so on. They did everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, they made some mosaics. Not a lot, but some mosaics. Now, what do you mean by mosaics? Well, the planes would go over. The reconnaissance planes would mm -hmm. go over. They'd take pictures. Okay, they come back with the pictures, and they had a 10-second overlap on the cameras. And when they came back, you would piece them together okay. and come up with one big picture. Then they would look at them, and uh, the, they would send them to the pilots down at the airstrip, and uh, they would fly the missions. And based on what reconnaissance took and what they had mapped out for the pilots, uh, that's where they have, the way they held their bombing raids. Mm -hmm. Now, when you went into the Pacific, where were you stationed? Hollandia, New okay. Guinea, mm -hmm. to begin with. What was that like? <clears throat> oh, man, I thought I was going to see Tarzan come out of the uh, jungle <laughs> <laughs> any minute. I'll tell you, when we were unloaded at uh, Hollandia, they brought us in on a barge. The Seabees were there, mm -hmm. and the Seabees had already built uh, the unit for our photo unit, which was 
some five, six miles up the coast. As we came in to Hollandia, I said, what the hell is all of this, you know? There were these great big piles of things. You couldn't tell what they were because it was a little bit dark. It was almost morning and uh, it was raining. And they had these big tarps over it. They said, this is a supply depot. They had these piles of shoes and shirts and clothes all down there at that end of the dock. And if you wanted something, if you needed shoes, then someone from your outfit would go down with a truck and they would pick up what supplies we needed mm -hmm. for our outfit. Um, going from that dock all the way up to our location, it took I said, an hour and a half, two hours. It was so slow. The, the island itself was all clay. Mm -hmm. And the road, the road to the area where we were to be stationed was filled in with all kinds of stuff, but it was very slippery for the trucks. We had trucks go over the edge. It was, it was very dangerous. Uh, and of course, the Japanese were still all over the island. The main fighting was over, pretty much, mm -hmm. okay? But all of the Australians, we had a lot of Australian infantry over there, and uh, Americans, uh, that set up a perimeter. And uh, we were never really allowed to go out of that perimeter unless we were called to take a picture. Mm -hmm. So I got called out to take pictures of Japanese that they shot, you know, and this sort of thing. Uh, but for a small town boy, I got to tell you, this was something else. And I, I have to tell you, when I was ready to get on a train, we got on a train at Little Falls to go to Camp Upton. Mm -hmm. My father was there, first time I ever saw him cry. He said to me, Bob, you'll rue the day you did this. <laughs> but I love you. Was he right? Yeah, he was right. When I got to New Guinea, I said to myself, how the blazes did I ever do this to myself? It was frightening. Mm -hmm. It was no fun, you know. What were your living conditions like? What did you live in? Uh, I lived in a tent. There were no permanent buildings at all that you lived the in? The only permanent building we had, we had a mess hall that was wide open, you know, built like a hut. Mm -hmm. You know, the sides were all open, so <laughs> anything and anybody could get in there. Um, we had Japanese that would come in at night to steal food or try to steal food, and they would shoot them up, you know. Uh, we had snakes coming through uh, the tents, scare the hell out of you. We had scorpions, so we slept with mosquito nets. All the while, you never went to bed without a, uh, a mosquito net over you. Never knew what was going to end up on it. Mosquitoes were unbelievable. Uh, we took uh, Adabrin mm -hmm. all the while, and it turned yellow from it after a while. And all day long, we'd take salt tablets because it was so blasted hot. Um, 110, 115 degrees in the shade, and you know, nothing but jungle all around you. We didn't have any showers per se. We had the, the 50 gallon drums, you know, with the usual bit of water in there that they'd bring up from one of the lakes and put it in. Or if it rained, we had that. Pull a cord and you weren't allowed to stay in there but for a few seconds, really. And that was to get the the red clay off. Any time you walked, any place, there was always dust all over the place. Uh, we had uh, fighter planes flying overhead all day long, seven days a week, coming in from their missions. They do their barrel rolls. We have them try to climb up the mountain that was right there alongside of where we were camped. Um, on occasion, 
one of them would try to go too far. They would stall out. You could stand there and watch them drop right into the jungle. Then they would send a crew out, mostly Australians, because they knew that area well. <clears throat> and uh, they would go up to try to find them and bring them back down. Now, what was your food like? Food? Huh. Everything was uh, dehydrated. Dehydrated eggs for breakfast, dehydrated uh, potatoes. Um, we had a lot of uh, shit on the shingle. That was good. I learned to love it. It was very tasty. How about spam? <laughs> we had spam. We had K rations, we had C rations, uh, and they weren't all that bad when you got used to them. Uh, the coffee was generally pretty decent. Uh, we did have a lot of canned food, which was nice. Um, after we served our time in uh, New Guinea, you, what, what was the structure like where you did your developing of the film? Oh, we had a we had a nice uh, developing. We had a nice arrangement, really. The CBs put it up, and uh, they knew what the ha had to be anyway. Uh, we had a K1A machine that uh, uh, developed a gun camera film. Uh, that, that machine came from Eastman Kodak, down in Rochester. Made me feel like I was at home. Uh, gun camera films would go in there, and uh, it was a reversal process. So when it came out at the end, it was ready. Those films go down to operations, and the pilots got to see their gun camera film, um, tell them how well they did, and whether they shot anybody down or they didn't. You know, um, basically we did a lot. Uh, a lot of it was printing uh, some of the bomb plots uh, that the bombers uh, flew B-24s mm -hmm. at the time. Um, most of the day was spent developing films, a lot of it, and we would get called out for different things. We had a hospital in uh, New Guinea, and uh, in fact, uh, General MacArthur had a headquarters way back in the jungle, uh, and uh, once in a while we'd see his uh, car go by, <laughs> salute, you know. Try to look like you weren't stupid. <laughs> well, yeah, I, you know, he was very fussy about some people, mm -hmm. but for the most part, we wore very few clothes when we were in New Guinea. But you have to remember that New Guinea was about as wild as Borneo, you know, at the time. Uh, you had all kinds of animals all over the place. When I talk about snakes, we had one snake that they shot right in our area. That thing was 14 feet long, and I gotta tell you, when they, after they killed him and they propped his mouth open, it was like this. To look at it, you know, you'd say to yourself, how'd you like to walk out in the jungle, the other side of the perimeter, and get nailed with one of those things? They're huge. And, you know, <laughs> talking about this, it, when I reflect on it all, I'm amazed that I made it back home. I am, really. We took a lot of chances on our own going out into the jungle. Uh, the one thing we were told was not to pick anything up if we went out the other side of the perimeter. <clears throat> and the reason for that was because the Japanese still had little traps out there for crazy people like me. I was young. <laughs> did you ever, excuse me, did you ever have problems with your equipment, with the humidity and, and so on, or any problems like that at all? No. No, we had uh, fans that were working off the generators, mm -hmm. so th that made it pretty comfortable inside, and it was closed most of the time. The only time it was open was when we came out of the dark room itself. Um, the humidity you know, on the outside, it was terrible. It really was. Um, you never gained any weight. You sweated all the while. I think I weighed a hundred and 
40 pounds or something when I went in. I probably didn't weigh much more than that when I came out. Did your immediate group lose any personnel? Did we lose any personnel? Yeah, we just lost one, one guy, a fellow by the name of Weedekind. Uh, but that was just through an automobile accident, a uh -huh. Jeep accident. I told you that the roads were slippery uh -huh. coming back. Uh, he went down to pick up some uh, developer and hypo that was waiting for us down there. We needed it. So he took the Jeep down and on the way back, his Jeep slid off the road. And he went down, oh, probably 100 feet, 120 feet off the side of the road. And he got killed. It, it almost buried him in the uh, clay. In fact, they let us see him afterwards. His glasses were all, he had sunglasses on. Glasses were pushed into his eyes. They shipped him back to the States after they registered him at grave registration. Um, other than that, we didn't lose anybody because most of our people were lab people. And uh, we were pretty well protected, you know, mm -hmm. every place that we were. Uh, now, how long were you uh, on uh, New Guinea? I was in New Guinea for about uh, five months. Four or five months. Mm -hmm. Then uh, when we left New Guinea, uh, we went up to uh, Moratai uh, in the Halmahera Islands. And uh, we were stationed there. Now Moratai was a small, really, coral reef. It was about a mile and a half uh, long and a couple miles wide. Now we had an airstrip there. And uh, we tied in with the uh, 13th uh, bomb group that was there, and they were flying um, B-17s or B-52s out of there. I don't recall which, but uh, uh, we went up there and did a lot of work for them, took a lot of pictures for them and that sort of thing. Incidentally, I might mention that uh, while I was in the States, um, and, he, and I was in Thomasville, Georgia, uh, I was always invited to the officers' clubs for their parties to take pictures. Yeah. 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 And uh, you got the same thing overseas. In New Guinea, uh, we would always get invited down to the parties. Uh, the, the officers had their own club. And you know, it wasn't all war. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were having good times too. They had the booze and they had the beer. and. They had the nurses, and uh, they had the girls from uh, the nurses from uh, Australia. So there were times when it was time for fun and relaxation. In fact, I, I got to mention this, uh, just to tell you that it is a small world. Uh, I was on my way up to the hospital to see one of the guys from our outfit that was in there. He was sick. And uh, on my way up, I was walking up the side road, and this truck went by, and this guy hollered, Hey, Dowsville! I said, that yeah, must be somebody from the outfit, you know, that knew I was from Dowsville. I got up to the hospital, and here was a guy from my hometown that I knew as a kid. He was older than I was. His name was Cole Wilbur, and he was a captain. And he was a P-47 pilot, and he wanted to take me up for a piggyback ride, but I wouldn't go. <laughs> no. Did you uh, ever fly any missions at all? Just one, uh, for Mortai, uh, but that was a quirk, you know. Um, I made friends with some of the guys in the 13th bomb group, and uh, they got me on a flight to uh, um, Balik uh, Pap and Borneo, so I went with them. Uh, they had automatic cameras on there that would go off every 10 seconds. So uh, when they dropped the bombs, the cameras were taking the pictures, and when they came back, I developed some of them. And uh, it was exciting, really. It was quite a flight. I had, I had silver fillings in my teeth, my back teeth. Jesus, I had toothaches all the way, out and back. You know? 
I never realized that, you know, something like that would happen, but it was the altitude at the time. And they weren't flying high, I mean 10,000 mm. feet, something like that. But you got decked out with a May vest and everything else, so you were ready for any problem. Mm -hmm. But that was the only one. Now, what were conditions like on Moratai? That there was a coral reef. You said it must have been. It a was just a coral thing. island, really. Uh -huh. um, and there were Japanese running all over the place, and we had uh, prisoners of war there, uh, and um, they were starving to death. You know, mm -hmm. once once the action was over, they were still all over the place. They never believed the war was over. I don't think they believe it today, some of them. They're probably still over there in New Guinea and in Moratai. They went out and looked for them and hunted them, but it was hard to find them. Uh, but I have pictures in there with Japanese prisoners. Uh, I had so many pictures. Uh, my, my grandchildren took them for different things, you know, at school. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them, I'm sure the school teachers liked them. You know, and they disappeared, but that's that's something else. I lost some coming back on the ship. Uh, they wanted to see the pictures that I had, and I showed them to them, and uh, uh, they were gone. But I got back to uh, the States. Somebody took them out of my bag. Now, how long were you in Moratai? Oh, geez, about... Three and a half months, something like that, and then and then the war ended in August. Mm -hmm. Couldn't believe it was over. I must have got I, I had no idea of how we were ever going to get back to the states. Then we went up to Leyte. Um, once we got into Leyte, oh, I might have been there before the war got over, but uh, once we got into Leyte, then. We were just a local photo outfit, that's all. We didn't do much of anything. We waited to be shipped back to the States. No, well, how did, did you hear about the dropping of the atomic bombs? The what? The atomic bombs. The atomic bomb? Yes. Well, <clears throat> see now there's something I didn't mention either. While I was on war time, uh, we uh, always got our information from Tokyo Rose. She was wonderful. She played all the nice music from back home. And she even announced that Moratai would be a bloodbath next day. And sure as hell, we got a bomb come over. And uh, it was nice to watch the artillery shoot down a couple of Betty bombers. It really was. Mm -hmm. It was something I hadn't seen before. But, uh, and then the question was? About the atomic bomb, did you, how did you hear about that and what was your reaction? We heard about it over the radio. Mm -hmm. That's how we heard about it. We always had a radio. In fact, I was trying to remember the names of the radios. They were from Australia. They were terrific. You could pick everything up. You had short wave. Mm -hmm. so, uh, reaction was one of unbelief that the war was really over, as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine getting back to the States. You know, when I went into the service, I never anticipated that I would ever end up in the South Pacific. I thought I would certainly go to Europe. My cousin Buddy went in with me, um, and we were in the same group in Miami at the time. And uh, this colonel that was inspecting us said, uh, you know, you'd be a great gunner. You're the right size for a gunner. I said, well, I'm off. I'm going to photography school. My cousin Buddy went to gunnery school. And they shipped him to Europe. He was 18. Uh, when he was 19, he was dead. Uh, he was killed on his first mission. He was a B-17 gunner. And 15 years later, they shipped his body back. And I went to the funeral in Auburn. They found it. A farmer found it up in the woods in Germany. Yeah. That was heartbreaking when I got that news, I'll mm -hmm. tell you. Did you ever um, get any tropical diseases at all, or malaria <coughs> or anything? Not me. Sunburn. <laughs> that was it. No, but uh, the natives got tropical diseases. 
Uh, there are pictures in there. Uh, they have elephantitis. Uh, they had uh, jungle rot. The little kids with jungle rot all over them at the foot. You know. You know, they didn't have homes. They had huts, thatched huts. They had uh, pigs, you know, for food. Uh, I don't know what else they ate, but it was just it was just like you'd see it in the movies. Just this side of cannibals, really. Um, one of the strange things on New Guinea, uh, because it was a Dutch-held island, the Netherlands East Indies mm -hmm. owned it. Um, we had people running around there, natives that were black and white as a result of the Dutch, mm -hmm. okay, that had been there. And that was the strangest thing to see. They would never let you take a picture of them, you know. How did you get home? Uh, I came home on a ship called, uh, as I recall, it was uh, Admiral Byrd's ship. He had used it for an Arctic exposition, expedition, and that's what we came home on. Not too many accommodations, really, on it. Coming home was the most exciting part of the war. Um, and yes, when we uh, came under the Golden Gate, oh yeah, the hoses were going off, you know, with the water, and mm -hmm. the stuff was coming down from the bridge. Uh, I'll tell you, it was breathtaking, really, to be back in the States. Uh, I'll never forget it. How'd your parents greet you? God, I'll tell you, when I got back to Dallasville, you know, I can see myself now. I, I went into, uh, we went to Fort Dix for our discharge, mm -hmm. and they asked that famous question, uh, would you like to join the reserves? <laughs> and the last thing I would ever have joined was the reserves. Mm -hmm. All I wanted was that ruptured duck that they were talking about and his signature on that discharge and I was out of there. I went into Trenton, changed my clothes, I bought a suit and a shirt and a new pair of nun bush shoes and I was on my way home. And that's how I arrived home with my duffel bag over my shoulder. But I can remember going around that corner to the house and I was so happy to be in Dallasville. And I can remember how happy I was to leave Dallasville when I went into the service. It was crazy. Um, at the time that I got home, uh, there were a lot of my buddies coming home and a lot of them that weren't home yet. So it was celebration, celebration, celebration. We were out drinking, dancing, playing cards down at the local beer joint. We were having a lot of fun. And uh, that went on for uh, about a month, I guess, a month and a half. Then I went back to school. I wanted to get my high school diploma. Mm -hmm. And I got a picture in there of uh, the group that went back to school with me. I got my high school diploma. And uh, after that, uh, I went to Utica College. Did you use the GI Bill for this? Huh? Did you use the GI Bill? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, to go to college. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I used the GI Bill to go to college. They were paying me $75 a month to go to school, and they paid all of my expenses. Um, so I went to school at Utica. I go early in the morning, 8 o'clock, get underway at 2 o'clock. Uh, I'd be in Little Falls. And when I got to Little Falls, I had a job in Snyder's Bicycle Factory, grinding bicycle frames. Dirty job. It would be coal black when I'd get out of there. Uh, but uh, it was a good job. And back then, I'm talking uh, 1946, yeah, uh, I was making $125 a week back then, grinding bicycle frames. It was a dangerous job, but it paid well. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to school at Utica for a year. 
uh, wasn't happy with it and wanted to go somewhere else. <clears throat> so I went to, uh, and in the meantime, I met my wife. I hadn't married her or anything, she was mm -hmm. my girlfriend. But anyway, I decided that I would like to go to Miami again, having been there before. So I took a transfer, I went down to Miami, still on the GI Bill of Rights, and uh, started down there. Uh, I spent a year there, and uh, when I came home on vacation, I got married. So after I got married, I decided, well, no sense to go to school anymore. I've got to do something else. So my wife was from Amsterdam, New York, um, and uh, I took a job in the rug mill. But I thought it was much better than that. But at the time, I needed money because we bought our furniture and our appliances, and we were broke, both of us. Uh, so I took the job in the rug mill as a weaver. I worked there for six months. That was enough to pay for my furniture and my appliances. Then uh, that job paid me about $150 a week weaving carpets. I was weaving ex-ministers in the lower ex-minister mill in Amsterdam. Um, then I took a job. I applied for it. There was a furniture store opening up, and I had always loved selling. I was a great salesman, and I thought I was anyway. <laughs> So I took a job for $32.50 a week as a salesman to build a future for myself. I got 1% commission on all the toasters they would allow me to sell and all the baby potty chairs because I had no experience. Well, as I got the experience and I really learned the business, next thing I knew I was making 7000 a week. I mean, seven thousand a year, seventy-two hundred, mm -hmm. and then that was good money, yeah. you know, back in those days. And finally, I decided that uh, okay, I'd worked there two years. I'm a manager, or I'm out of here. So they gave me a manager's job in Mechanicville, New York, of all places. I worked there for a year, maybe a year and a half. Did a good job for them, and came here to Union. It was Union Firm, was it? and uh, managed a store here on Broadway in Saratoga Springs. Then from Saratoga to Utica, they managed their biggest store, and from Utica up north of Watertown to a different company. And that, uh, after that, I went to work for my company board as a district manager. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of experience. I worked for them for 20 years. I was 37 when I went to work for them and uh, retired from there. Now, did you uh, join any veterans organizations at all? Well, I'll tell you, when uh, I got back to Dallasville, I decided, well, American Legion's here, I'll go down to the Legion, see what I think about it, you know. So I went down there, and um, it wasn't anything I wanted to get involved in. All the guys, they were old men, you know. Mm -hmm. None of my buddies had gone. So I just went to the one meeting and I said, no, nah, this isn't for me. Uh, in Saratoga, uh, I joined uh, the small dome post mm -hmm. over here. But uh, I belonged to that for about uh, 10 years, 12 years. I never went to any of it. The reason I joined it was because one of my buddies was running for commander. <laughs> and he needed a boat. Yeah, so, you know. Mickey something, I can't even remember his last name. But uh, no, I never really bothered too much. Did in you? Fact, oh, I'm sorry. No, in fact, you know, I, I belong to the museum, but I don't get down here that often. Mm -hmm. uh, I belong to a lot of organizations like the Kiwanis, uh, I belong to the Elks, mm -hmm. belong to the Knights of Columbus. Uh, after I retired, I, I gave a lot of this up because. I had been away from my wife a lot. See, when I worked for my company board, I was on the road mm -hmm. most of the time. Uh, so I wouldn't get home but for weekends, really. And then I'd spend a day in the office in Albany. Mm -hmm. I was doing all the paperwork. So. Did you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? Did I what? Ever stay in contact with anyone that was in oh, service yeah. with you? Yeah, a friend of mine uh, lives out in Arizona and has been 
trying to get me to come out to Arizona to live ever since. In fact, the guy's name was Sam Fianaka. He and I spent much of our overseas time together. Uh, and he was a great comfort, believe me. He and I got along well. Um, during, after the war, uh, when uh, Lottie and I got married, good old Sam came to the rescue. I didn't have a car, okay? So Sam had a brand new Buick and he and his wife Lena came up and handled the whole thing for us. And Lottie and I got married and when we left, he took me all the way to Rochester with him, which is where he lived. And I took a bus from Rochester to Auburn. And uh, my uncle owned a uh, car dealership there, a Plymouth dealership. Gave me a brand new uh, Plymouth to take on my honeymoon. Uh, at the time, my father-in-law was dying, Lottie's father. So we spent our honeymoon in Niagara Falls for a few days. Uh, then we proceeded on up to the shrine in Montreal uh, to have prayers said for him. And then we went, went up to uh, Quebec to St. Anne de Beaupre and had masses said for him. Well, after the honeymoon was over, we came back. That was in May. Uh, he died in June. So I lived with my mother-in-law. I lived upstairs. She had an apartment upstairs. Mm -hmm. so we lived there to begin with. How do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? It had a tremendous effect on my life. Uh, I was a wise guy when I was young. But I got a deep appreciation for everyone and everything, believe me. Um, I love people. <laughs> After what I'd seen over there, I love people more than ever, alive. Um, I feel terrible about this war that's going on now. Mm -hmm. I mean it. Um, I would love to see it end. But, you know, when you're in a service, you meet all walks of life, mm -hmm. and you have to cope with a lot of different things. So you learn to have patience. Nothing happens fast in the service anyway. It never did. Now if you hold this up, could you tell us where and when that was taken? Yep. This was taken at uh, Lowry Field, uh, Denver, Colorado, uh, in uh, photography school. Okay. Do you have any other photographs you want to show us? Well, I've got a lot of photographs if you'd like to look at them. Um, we could, you know, add them into the tape if you wanted to. Uh, maybe I could take some of them out if you'd like to see them. Uh, this is our encampment in uh, Leyte. I don't know how well it'll come out with this uh, shiny yeah. Material on them. Okay. okay. Yep, I got it. Okay. Uh, here's a bombing in uh, Ballycopapin, Borneo. If you hold it back a little further, he can focus. Okay. In That's there. all right. I got it. Okay. All right. Okay. This was a group that uh, went overseas with me from uh, Muskogee, Oklahoma. Okay. What's the best one? I got so much stuff in here. Oh, this is a, a, another shot of where we live in uh, Leyte in the Philippines mm -hmm. as the war was coming to a close. It was just rain, rain, and more rain. Uh, Well, you might be interested in these. Here are some of the pictures that I took uh, in uh, uh, New Guinea. Okay, that was a bunker that these Japanese were in. The Australians come across them. That was early in the morning. It wasn't too far from our perimeter. <clears throat> then there were a couple of Australians that were killed in this, and this happened. Okay. But it's an interesting picture. Should I take a look at it? 
And <laughs> here's a picture of myself uh, with a couple of Japanese prisoners at Moratai. We had quite a few Japanese prisoners there. Okay. No, I think that's pretty much rounds it out. Okay. okay. Uh, do you want to show us that artillery shell you have, or the? Uh, yeah, that's tracer. what it is. This is a uh, this is a shell that's used in the uh, P thirty nine training planes. Uh, it's a uh, thirty seven millimeter tracer, and uh, I wanted the museum to have it because the case shows that it's a 1942 vintage. Okay. They might be interested in it. All right, great. All right, well, thank you very much for your interview. Very good I was glad to do it. Very good interview.